Okay, turn with me in your Bibles to Mark chapter 4. So Mark chapter 4, starting at verse 35. So Mark Mark chapter 4, starting at verse 35. And the Bible says, On that day, when evening had come, he said to them, Let us go across to the other side. And leaving the crowd, they took him with them in a boat, just as he was. And other boats were with him. And a great windstorm arose, and the waves were breaking into the boat, so that the boat was already filling. But he was in the stern, asleep on a cushion. And they woke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? And he awoke and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. He said to them, Why are you so afraid? Have you still no faith? And they were filled with great fear and said to one another, Who then is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? So, Father, we thank you that your word is alive. We thank you that your word is living, it's active, it's quick, it's powerful. Father, we're declaring your word is going forward here today. Holy Spirit, speak to our hearts. We pray that you would take your word where you want it to go. And we're believing, O God, that, Lord, that hearts are open and ready to receive. We're declaring that your word is going forward. Bringing forth fruit, some 30, 60, and 100 fold, that your word is, Father, changing our thoughts and changing our attitudes, that's changing our life. We thank you, Lord, for the miracle of your word. We're believing you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. So starting off in verse 35, on that day when evening had come, he said to them, let us go across to the other side. So God has a destiny call upon your life. He has a call and a plan upon you. You're called even with the heart of the Lord in mind. We have a place that he says is yours. It is a destiny place. Your Your life is not like a battle top or a spinning top that just spins until it stops and goes haphazardly. No, there is a plan. There is a purpose. There is a God that is a God of timing. He's a God of planning. That's who he is. He's not haphazard. He's not all about randomness. No, he's a God with plan and purpose. And we see in the Old Testament that as he was building the ark, there was a plan. And he was saying that, that Noah, I want you to build it according to these specifications. Specifications. I know what's coming ahead. I know the waters that are going to come. It's going to be built in such a way that it's going to float. It's going to be built in such a way that it's going to last the storm. It's going to be built in such a way that even the animals are going to be that, that are going to be carried and the people that are in. It's going to be built in a way that there's provision for the future. And so God was telling the disciples, we are going to the other side. So the destiny destiny was in the Lord at that point. The destiny at that moment was short term and it was to go to the other side. So where you're at in your life, God is calling to take you to the other side. He's calling you to go to the destiny that he's prepared you for. You're going to float. You're going to last. You're going to see the provision of the Lord because that's why he is God. He loves you. He cares about you. He died for you. He's a God that takes care. He's a good shepherd and he's leading his sheep and he's guiding his sheep. The enemy would try to say that this is haphazard. It's not making sense. It's going in a random direction, but no, in the midst of it all, God is a God of plan and purpose and he's bringing you into a destiny call. He's bringing you to the other side. He's bringing you into his plan for your life. He knows the intellect that he's given you. He knows the the personality that he's given you. He knows all the things that are gifted even in your life. He knows the things that you're dealing with. He knows the quirks. He knows the limitations. He knows the weaknesses. He knows the generational line. And he says, I'm going to bring it all together to work for good. I'm going to bring it all together to form my plan. And when, my, when you see even the plan that comes forward for your life, God knits all things together. He's knitting you into a 
his plan and he's causing it all to work out that his plan would be that that is accomplished. So you and I are not smart enough to realize his plan. We're not big enough to know his plan. We're not ones that would know every moment. Yes, he gives us prophetic words. Yes, he gives us insights. He gives us revelation, but we see darkly through a glass. So at that moment, like the disciples, when we hear the word, I'm going to take you to the other side. We have to be those that are people of faith and saying, God, yes, I believe you. I don't understand you. I don't have all the pieces of the equation, but God, I'm believing you to bring this to the other side. And verse 36, and leaving the crowd, they took him with them in the boat, just as he was. And the other boats were with him, and a great windstorm arose, and the waves were breaking into the boat, so that the boat was already filling. Now it's interesting that they said, and leaving the crowd, they took him with them in the boat just as he was. So he's saying, I'm God all by myself, just as I am. I don't need you to intervene. I don't need you to correct my plan. I don't need you to specialize even in your mind to make my plan better. I'm God all by myself, just as I am. I'm able to bring you through just as I am. I'm able to provide for you just as I am because I am all that you need. I am all that you could ever desire. I am all that you want just as I am. I don't need to get bigger. I don't need to get smarter. I don't need to do anything different because I am just as I am. So we realize that even in that moment, they brought the great I am. Did they fully understand in the deep place in their life that this is the one that is the God of the universe? Did they have have a revelation in their heart that he is the great I am. How deeply did they understand that in their heart that as they were bringing him just as he was, he was and is and always will be the great I am and he was in the boat with them. And the other boats were with him, and a great windstorm arose, and the waves were breaking into the boat, so that the boat was already filling. Now, in that area, the Sea of Galilee, it's actually located beneath the surface of, of sea level. It's about 900 feet below, and there are mountains on either side, and it's like this big teacup. And down in that low area beneath sea level was the Sea of Galilee. And when Winds would rise and it was this area that was, it was an, a difficult area to sail. It was a different area to navigate their boats. And these fishing boats were maybe about, scholars tell us, about 25, 27 feet long. But they were used to waves. They were used to rough waters. They were used to difficult situations. Even just the whole topography of the land made windstorms that that was common. But the Bible says that a great windstorm arose, and there's a Greek prefix that's attached to that, and it's, it's a mega. So when we're talking about a storm, man, this is the mother of all storms. And in the original, it talks about a whirlwind, and I think of almost like a tornado wind. We might call it a hurricane today, but it was something that was beyond the norm. It was something that was bigger than what they thought. It was something that was bigger than what they had experienced before. Before, it was a mega storm. It was a giant storm. It was a big storm. And these men, they were experienced sailors. They were ones that knew what it was to sail in the midst of the wind. They knew what it was to sail in the midst of the storm. But yet this thing arose upon them. It was a mega storm. And other boats were with them. And this thing began to be that that challenged even their own resources, their own ability to think their way through. They would have known what it was to navigate through a storm. They would have known, I've been through this before. Let's steer in this direction. Let's bring down the sail. You go over there. You go over there. We're going to ride this thing out. And I'm sure they tried that, but this was a big storm. It was a mega storm. It was a big storm. So they 
ran dry of everything that was a natural inclination, everything that was a natural ability, everything that they had relied on to navigate them through other storms. They had run even to the end of themselves and they found themselves wanting. They were not able to navigate this storm. They weren't able to navigate this trial. They weren't able to solve this one. They weren't able to correct this one. No, this thing was bigger. It was a mega storm. So in the midst of the storm, God will cause us to be depleted even in the midst of our own strength. Why is that? Because that self nature wants to be the boss. That self nature wants to be the king. That self nature wants to be self-reliant. As, as Lucifer spoke about in, in, uh, in the Old Testament, he said that I will be like the Most High. I will, I will, I will. And that self nature inside of you and inside of me, it says, I will. I will handle this situation. I will do it this way. I will work out my plan that way. I will, I will, I will. And there's something in the midst of life where God desires in his mercy and in his love to separate us from from the I wills. Why? Because when we are self-reliant, man, we come in low, 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 low. When we are self-reliant, we miss the mark. When we are self-reliant, we make a mess of it. If we're self-reliant in the midst of our marriage, we'll make a mess of it. If we're self-reliant in the midst of the navigation of our emotions and the navigation even of our relationships, if we're all about me and all about what I can do and reliant on everything that I am, we're going to come up short. We're going to come up wanting. We're going to come up missing the mark. We're going to come up as those that are even deficient, even in the moment. But God says, no, I want to bring you even to a place of exceeding abundantly. I want to bring you beyond what you can do. I want to bring you to the new level. I want to bring you to the next level. So in the midst of the storm, they were changed. They knew they didn't have what it takes to navigate the storm. Do you ever feel like you don't have what it takes to navigate the storm? Do you ever feel as though you don't have the resources to navigate the storm? Somebody won't cooperate with you and you're trying to navigate the storm and they just will not cooperate with you. Somebody is off in a place where they're even living in the realm of the flesh. Maybe they're living in a place of anger and living in a place of, of, of just ugliness in the terms of a mood and you're dealing with it even even in that moment, and you're saying that, oh God, I just can't control what they do. Know that you can't. The only one you control is yourself. You can't control anybody else, and even that, we give ourselves to the Lord because at the end of the day, we're unable to fully navigate the storm to exercise that place that God wants to bring us to. So the Bible says again, and a great windstorm arose and the waves were breaking into the boat so that the boat was already filling. Now, I, sometimes we can read this and I don't know about you, but I sometimes I just read it and I gloss over it. But when you think about breaking into the boat, that's a pretty strong word. Now, if you picture this thing as a hammer and I'm going to break it into the pulpit. No, I'm not, but I thought I just got your attention. But if I were to take this thing and if I were to begin to slam it into the pulpit and I begin to break it I'm not strong like a hurricane but I could knock that thing over and if I got McDonald over here and called him up and got him to lift this thing up he's bigger than I am he would probably break the pulpit and break this and man that would be a great object illustration you might not be back again next week but it would be cool at the moment but when you're in the midst of something that is breaking and falling apart God gets your attention. And I'm not saying he authors it. I'm not saying he's one that desires to bring your hurt because he doesn't. But life has a way of bringing the breaking storm into our life. Life has a way of breaking across the bow. It's something that was in the original. This storm was violent. The ones that are Greek scholars are saying the storm was a violent storm. And it began to break. So you can imagine 
that their lifeline at that moment, their thinking was this boat that they'd sailed for many times. They had confidence in this boat and now the boat was beginning to break. How many know that that's not a good feeling when you're out in the water and the boat is beginning to break? And so they were ones that began to panic. They were ones that began to panic. This thing was over the top, and so they looked at Jesus, and then they came to Jesus even in the midst of that storm. And they said, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? Now, when you think about that, even in the midst of it, they're talking about the creator of the universe. They're talking about the one that that the Israelites in their history, they saw Mount Sinai alight with the flame of the Lord. They saw miracles. They saw the, the Red Sea opened up and the Egyptians were going after them. They were swallowed up and all this would have been passed down. So the God of the universe was even in the midst of it. But in the flesh nature, in that lower nature, there was this place of disrespect now to the king of the universe. There was a a place where they disrespected God even in that moment. They made God as big as what they are. They brought God down to their level. They weren't going up to God's level. They were bringing God right down to their level. And they were unable to handle it. They knew they were going to perish. And they said, are you going to let us perish? There was an attitude toward him even in that moment, and it was birthed out of fear. It was birthed out of self-reliance. And sometimes when we're walking in that place of fear, we say things we wish we had never had said. We do things we wish that we had never had done. When we're in that place where we're trusting in ourselves and our trust is what we can do, what we can conjure up, what we can think, what we can plan what we can do in whatever way there's something about that realm of fear is when we don't have the ability to make it beyond the place where we are at we cannot solve this problem so they came into a place of great disrespect to the god of the universe at that point don't you care that we are going to die you're asleep in the boat. What's wrong with you? You don't care. So they began to judge him in their heart. And the enemy will try to get you to judge God in your heart. You don't care about me. You're not able to meet my needs. You don't care, God. This trial is going on. This thing is happening. God, I'd rather be on my phone than listen to you because, God, I just, there's something where you just fall short. And the flesh nature is that that would come to a place of disrespecting and judging the Lord as we bring him into a place where we belittle him and make him the size of our own understanding. So when the Proverbs talks about trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not to your own understanding, our own understanding will shipwreck us. Our own understanding will bankrupt us. Our own understanding will bring us to the point where we fall short of the destination. Our own understanding is what the enemy tries to navigate in the midst of the storm. In the midst of the storm, the enemy will begin to speak into your mind. That's not going to work out. Look what she's doing now. That's never going to work. That's always going to be that way. It's never going to change. Look at, you know where that's going, don't you? That thing is going south. It's going down. It's not going to work out. But the enemy will try to bring you into a place and bring me into a place of my own understanding and your own understanding. So at that moment when they were in the midst of the storm, they were in their own understanding. And their own understanding made them very, very much afraid. Their own understanding filled them with doubt. Their own understanding filled them even in that place now where life was about to end. Their heart rate, I'm sure, was about 200. Their blood pressure was probably 205 or 130. They were at the end of themselves. Why? Because they were living in their own understanding. So when we are 
carnally minded, the Bible says that the carnal mind is enmity or hostility against God. When we are living in our own thoughts and our own ways and our own power and we're limiting God in the midst of it, it ends up that we fall short of even that that God wants to bring us into. But he was in the stern, asleep on the cushion, and they woke and said to him, Teacher, do not... Do you not care that we are perishing? And he awoke and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace be still. And the wind ceased. So that word in verse 39, where the Bible says, And he awoke and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace be still. And the wind ceased. In the original, that peace be still is to silence or to muzzle. I don't know about you, but sometimes when I see a rough looking dog, a dog that I would be afraid of, a dog that I wouldn't feel comfortable around, but when I see that the owner has a muzzle upon that thing, I feel more confident being around that dog. I feel more safe being around that dog. When there's a nice steel muzzle around that thing and it can't open its mouth, it can't bite me or anybody else around, it gives me a certain sense of satisfaction, a certain sense of safety when I see the muzzle. So at that moment when Jesus rebuked the wind and the waves, a hurricane force, he put a muzzle upon that thing. And some people believe that there was a demonic spirit that was behind that storm. Some people believe that there was a demonic power that was rising up. And I want to say that whatever power comes against you, you've got authority in his name. You've got power in his name. The enemy cannot even do that that is able to get the victory on your life unless you allow it. We have the power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy. And Luke 10, 19, and the Bible goes on to say, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. You have a muzzle in your toolkit. You have a muzzle in your hand. And when that spirit begins to speak to your mind, when that spirit begins to growl and grit its teeth at you and tell you you'll always be this way, you'll never change, it's never going to happen, you've missed it now you have the power to muzzle that thing and to tie it up because he's given us authority over the mega storm in his name hallelujah Amen. so Jesus he rebuked the wind and the waves and he said peace be still and the wind ceased and there was a great calm so now in the midst of this mega storm this hurricane there was this mega calm. There was this complete 100%, not a ripple, mega calm. Because he spoke the word and this thing was silenced. This thing was silenced. Now why did they go through all this? Jesus was showing that he was God over the elements. He was showing that these things are not greater than him. He was showing himself to the disciples, this is who I am. And in the midst of your trial, God desires to show you who he is. In the midst of your trial, he desires to show you who he is and what he's all about. The enemy comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy, but God comes that he might show you who he is in the midst of the trial. Now watch this as, as we move on. And in verse 40, he said, he said to them, why are you so afraid? Have you still no faith? And they were filled with great fear and said to one another, who then is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? So they're in a hurricane and then he rebukes them for not having faith. It's, I always thought, wow, that's, that's, that's a lot, Lord. That's, that's a real heavy thing. But in the midst of it, when you're hanging on for dear life, I want to say hang on to faith. In the midst of it, hang on to faith. Now, you've got to talk to yourself in the midst of that. You've got to rearrange your thinking. When you're thinking 
keeps telling you to go towards doubt and all the reason why it's not going to work out. When your thinking tells you all the reasons why you need to be afraid. When your thinking tells you all the reasons why this thing is falling apart and it's never going to happen. We need to activate and change our minds. We need to gird up the loins of our mind with truth. We need to apply that helmet of salvation. What does that mean in practical terms? That means that our thoughts need to line up with the thoughts of the Lord. Sometimes when I'm filled with fear and I'm sitting at home and I can feel fear coming upon me and I begin to examine my thoughts, I'm coming into agreement with the enemy at that moment. And I'm in agreement that, yeah, this is not looking too good right here or that happened in the past so it could happen again here and I can't see the way out so yeah, that just might happen. And I begin to feel fear beating even in my heart. But when I change my thoughts, even in that moment, and you know what? You're not gonna feel like changing your thoughts in the midst of the storm. If you're waiting for your feelings to feel good about changing your thoughts in the middle of the storm, you're going to be waiting a long time. It's not about your feelings. Don't get caught up in your feelings in the midst of the storm. The enemy desires to make you feel all kinds of things and we're emotional people and we are people that would be swayed if we let it by our feelings and by our emotions. Don't get caught up in what you feel because at the base of those feelings, there's a group of thoughts and after those thoughts go forward, they produce feelings. That's just the way that we're made. That's the way that life works. Thoughts, feelings. They're connected one to another. I can remember a number of years ago just thinking about, wow, if I had a million dollars, what would I do? And I, I remember thinking about this. My mood began to change. I began to feel good. And it was like, and then afterwards, I'm like, oh my goodness, wow, I can really see how this works. In the midst of the battle, you need to hang on to that rudder, and that's the word, and you need to choose your thoughts even in the midst of it. But I've tried that and it doesn't work. I still feel bad. It's not about your feelings. It's not about my feelings. It's about hanging on to that word and you persevere in the word. Why? Because he's making soldiers. He's making saints. He's making grown up people. Even in the midst of life, he's causing you and I to grow up from spiritual babies to be spiritual men and spiritual women ready for the battlefield and spiritual men and spiritual women women are those that hang on to the word and choose to think the word. There's a discipline that comes in the midst of it. If you're just waiting for it to get better, you might be waiting some time. If you're just going to camp out on your phone, even waiting for things to get better. If you're going to camp out in social media, just looking for some distraction in life. When you shut that thing off, you're going to feel just as bad, sometimes worse, because there's a lot of garbage and pollution. You might be sucked into social media. You might get bad bad thoughts from what people are th uh, vomiting sometimes on posts and maybe some of these things that are showing all these lewd women out there and all the different things that's a part of the internet now that is not the answer in the midst of your battle it's not the answer in the midst of your storm it's about grafting and engrafting the word of God into our thinking as mature saints. We need to hang on to that word and change our thoughts. Lately, I've been meeting people very, very recently, meeting people, nobody in here, and, and, and I begin to see people, and they come, and they talk, and, and, and they're pouring out maybe some of their struggles, and some of the weaknesses, and some of their situations look to be so difficult, and so desperate, and I look, and I think, wow, that's a lot, and then I've walked away thinking, you know, I used to be just like that. When did I get over that? I used to be just like that, and I want to say, that if you continue in the word the used to be won't be what you will be because what you will be is in his word and the used to be will be something in the past it won't be what you are because what you're thinking is what you become 
and I've looked at some of the people and, and some of the things they're going through and the amount of fear and insecurity and as they're, they're pouring out just struggles that they're going through. I look back and I think, wow, God, I'm just not where I once was. I mean, I'm growing and I'm coming into a place, but I'm just not where I once was. So I want to encourage you in the midst of the battle, hang on. In the midst of the battle, grab on to that rudder and keep that word in your heart even if you don't feel like doing it if the devil tells you it's not working you hang on to that word you hold on to that word until that word grows down deep in your heart now I had a bare patch in my lawn. I was doing some work out front, was driving a truck to pull out a tree, spun the wheels, some of the grass went with it. This bare patch was on there, so I had to get some seed and soil, began to plant that thing, and Charlene, I planted it, and the next day, I wish I could say that I had a big bushy bunch of grass, but there was nothing. I didn't see any change at all. There was absolutely nothing. And I was watering that thing maybe twice a day. And day two, I look at it, nothing. Absolutely nothing. Day three, nothing. Day four, nothing. But by faith, I had to keep watering that seed. By faith, I had to keep putting water on that grass seed, believing that if I did so, it would bear fruit. Believing that if I did so, that thing would begin to to grow up inside of the ground that looked bare, inside of the ground that looked like there was nothing, inside of that ground where it looked like there was nothing but dirt. But when that seed went into the ground and I began to water it, God was doing something beneath the surface that only he can do. I can't make a seed grow. I can't make a seed respond to heat. I can't make a seed respond to water. I can't make a seed be a seed that comes that's genetically pro, uh, 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 made in such a way that it's going to become grass that's up to him I can't do that but I can apply what he's given me and as I began to water that thing it seemed like I turn around and wow this thing's starting to grow grass and right now it's in the midst of growing and I keep watering that's how it is with your spiritual walk that's how it is with your life that's how it is with your mind if you stay in a mood and you stay depressed and you stay sulking guess what what your thoughts are going in that direction and bringing you in that direction. But if you begin to cultivate the word of God and plant it deep in your heart and in your mind, there's something that begins to grow out of that. There's something that begins to change out of that. There's something that is even abundant, even growth that comes out of that. There were times in my life where I struggled intensely and I would memorize portions of scripture portions and portions and portions and portions of scripture and I'd be going at day after 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 day that's what it felt like it was going over it and over it and over it but when you water that thing there is an incorruptible seed that's lying beneath the surface of your circumstances it's lying in the even in the depths of your heart that incorruptible seed when it goes in it grows up and produces fruit some 30 60 and a hundred fold so I want to say you do yourself a favor and use the seed do yourself a favor and plant the seed do yourself a favor and even water the seed that's inside of you because when your season comes around you're gonna see a harvest you're gonna see the glory of the Lord and the thing Things that troubled you in the past aren't going to trouble you in the future. The things that pulled you down in the present, those things are turning direction. There's something that's an atomic mega power that's inside of you, that incorruptible seed. And I want to encourage you is utilize it. Grow up. That's what we all need to do. I need to grow up into maturity. I need to grow up into that place where I'm governed by the word and not by my emotions where I'm governed by the word and not by my feelings there is something powerful about a saint that will get into the word and apply the word 
Why do you think it's such a battle to get to church? Why do you think it's such a battle to open up your Bible? Why do you think it's such a battle to begin to do spiritual things and apply the principles of God? Because the enemy is standing on the other side of that door. And as you're putting your hand into that door of prosperity, when you're putting your hand on that door of, of, of victory, when you're putting your hand even upon that door to an open opportunity and God is leading you in the midst of it. The enemy's on the other side pushing out that door. Don't let them open that door. Make them feel as though they don't want to get into the word. Don't let them open that door. Cause them to feel like they don't feel like they don't feel like doing anything. Put thoughts in their mind where they can be discouraged or where they can be depressed. Don't let them open that door because the minute that you and I begin to open up that door there's something that's released to us and man you look back if that's your life pattern and that's your lifestyle you are coming into a place of massive victory massive favor even as we apply the word of God God has a plan to prosper you and not to harm you a plan to give you a hope and a future and sometimes I look back thinking man I wish I'd applied myself more to the word well you know what I can do it today I can do it now don't worry about the past repent and go back don't go back if the past is something that you're not happy with or maybe it's the inventory is just not the way that you want it to be I want to say shut that door and go on and let the rest of your life God's able to restore the years that the locusts and the canker worm have eaten he's able to give supernatural multiplication he's able to do more in a minute than what we can do in a lifetime so don't let the enemy tell you it's too late that you wasted too much time no, go forward now because he's a God of multiplication. And he desires to multiply inside of you. That's who he is. He's a good God. His nature is good. He's good. He's good. His nature is one where he is good. So finally in verse 41. The Bible says, and they were filled with great fear and said to another, who then is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? Again, when I spoke about that word mega, that's the, the thing behind the storm, it's the same mega that's behind the great fear. And so they were in a place where they were experiencing fear fear like they never ever knew now I'm not talking about afraid it, in the original it's reverence it's wow did you see that that was amazing how could that have happened that is cool who is this wow he was revealing himself in the midst of it so he took them from the place where they had disrespected him don't you care if we pan if we die do you not care they accused him of not caring they accused him of not doing anything they accused him they judged him they belittled him that was their flesh nature and he changed that whole thing and brought them way over to the other side where they were like wow who is this he's amazing he is wonderful and he was building a bridge to their heart now in the midst of the trial God is building a bridge to your heart because there are times where if we read and we intellectualize something it doesn't necessarily go down always into our heart but when we see God in the midst of life and we see him in the midst of trial the building goes to our heart the bridge goes to our heart there's a connectivity with our heart and he creates a greater fear of the Lord and when we fear the Lord we turn to him we become more open to him when we're more open to him he can bless us when we're, he blesses us we become more happy there is something even a great choice in the midst of it where God is building in the hour that we're in he's building a mega fear of the Lord 
over the church because the days ahead are going to be days, I'm saying, where the wind and the waves are brewing now. There's persecution we know is getting ready to blow across the winds of the church. And now is not the time to be on your phone. Now is not the time to be even accusing God of not being all that you thought he would be. Now is not the time to be disappointed with him because we've listened to our flesh and blamed him. Now is the time to press into him that he might bless us and carry us through because the storms are coming against the church, but he's able to silence the storm. He's able to protect us in the midst of persecution. He's able to bring us all the way through. He's able to do exceedingly abundantly in the midst of the storm more than what we could ask or think. The enemy would try to bring in fear, but no, God says my protection's upon you. My grace is upon you. My goodness is upon you. Open up your heart to me and open up your heart to my ways. Let me show myself to you even in the midst of life because he wants to bless and not curse. He's all about blessing his people. The family came up today. They don't have an intention to curse that little girl. They brought her to the Lord that she might have the favor of the Lord. So if we who are evil know how to do good things for our kids, how much more will our Father in heaven give good gifts to those that are asking? So I want to encourage you in the midst of of the storm he's bringing you through a destiny to the other side he's transferring your confidence from yourself to him he's building the fear of the lord that he might review with your heart who he is and reveal who he is that you might become open that he might get that open door into your heart and bless you more I can, my wife could make me sometimes tea in the morning. And if I gave her a little thimble full and said, yeah, can you please make me a tea and gave her the thimble and she filled it. Well, she gave me a full cup, but that's all I wanted was that little thimble full. That's what I got. But there are times where she comes in with this big honking mug and it's, it's, it's a big, it's a big mug. And I'd rather get the big mug. And this is what he's attempting to do. He's attempting to give you the big mug. And when your heart is open, when the door to your heart is wide open, he can pour in. But if you're living in a place where you have the wrong idea of who God is, afraid of who he is, and maybe, you know, you've chosen other things of this world over him and you're giving him the little thimble full okay well god here you go here's a little thimble full and he gives you the thimble full and then you're disappointed because it's a thimble full the whole thing is a chain of events it's a whole thing of dominoes and so he's trying to open up hearts he's trying to pour out more than what you could ask or think he's trying to bless you in ways that you are unable to bless yourself he's trying to prosper you and not to to harm you and so in the midst of it he's revealing himself even in the midst of the storm so I want to encourage you is to make this thing count take a big giant bite out of what God has for you don't settle for a thimble get all you can from him get all the word of God that you can bless other people because it'll come back to you bless those that are around you because it'll come back to you minister to those that are around you don't focus in on just you because if you do that's a thimble if you focus in and you bless others guess what God's going to come back to you I want to see you make this thing work and I want to see every single one prosper and I believe that's the will and the plan of God in the midst of it all. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. So let's go before the Lord. Let's go before him now. Hallelujah. Praise you, Jesus. Hallelujah, Lord. Praise you, Jesus. Now just... Focus in on him for a minute. Don't think about how quickly you want to leave, what else is, needs to be done, you're, how hungry you are. Don't think about these things right now. Focus in on him right now. Just focus in on him.
He's on the other side of that door, and he's waiting for you to open up your heart. You might be saved, but he's waiting for you to open up your heart. He, he's not demanding it. He, he's not breaking the door down. He's waiting. He's waiting. He's waiting. Can you open up your heart just a little bit more? Can you trust him just a little bit more? Well, Father, we repent, O oh God, where we've minimized you in our sight. Father, where we've decided we're like grasshoppers in the midst of these giants. Lord, we repent where we've minimized you down to our own thoughts and our own ways. Father, forgive us where we've minimized you. And Lord, I'm asking, O oh God, in the name of Jesus, that Father, that a spirit of revelation, Father, would rest upon my sister that's here today. That a spirit of revelation would rest upon my brother that's here today. Father, I pray, dear God, that there would be an anointing, Father, that would be released in this house here today. Father, I pray, dear God, that the anointing of revelation, Father, would fall in a great way. Father, even now, let the revelatory realms of the Lord open up. Father, let the revelatory realms that are in the realm of dreams, let it open up to this people. Father, I pray that there would be revelation in the ears, that there would be revelation in the heart. Father, I pray, dear God, that you would open wide the portals of revelation. Father, we're declaring the portals of heaven, Lord, as we preach your word, the portal attached to this word. Father, I pray, dear God, that you would open it up, that Jesus, you're the ultimate door, you're the ultimate portal. So we pray, dear God, that there would be a portal of revelation from the word that we went over today. I pray that the revelatory realm of the Lord would be opened up, that the portal would open up. I pray, dear God, that there would be waves of understanding, waves of glory, waves of victory opened up to this people, Lord. Father, let there be a prosperity. Father God, let there be a blessing that makes rich. Father, and adds no sorrow to it. Father, we pray that the blessing of the Lord would outshine. I pray that the victory of the Lord would outshine. And Father, we pray, dear God, that every work of the enemy, Father, would be that that you would expose. And Father, I pray, dear God, that you would pull down every thought, bring every thought captive in the name of Jesus. And I see in the spirit, I see a fort with a wall around it. And there's all these people trying to get up into the fort. And I'm taking authority now over every assignment that's trying to take over your mind now. Every assignment that's trying to scale the, the walls of your mind. We take authority over every power now that would attack the mind. Every mind binding spirit, I command you to come off the mind. Mental torment, you come off the mind. Depression, you come off the mind. Mind. every assault on your mind I take authority over it now spirits of depression discouragement I command you to lift off of God's people lift off the mind now in the name and through the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ of Nazareth we break every assignment on your mind now we pull it down now in the name of Jesus Father, I pray that your angels would be released in the battle of the mind. I pray that your angels of warfare would be released. I pray, dear God, that the power of the Holy Ghost, Father God, would fall upon every mind represented here today. Father, we scatter the enemy. We command every assignment on the mind to lift. We command it to go. We command it to come all the way off now in the name and through the blood of the Lord Jesus.